Hello. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rosie, and welcome to the second podcast in our Ulster Orchestra Let's Play at Home series. Um, I'm joined today by two of my fabulous colleagues, Greg and Joanna, who I'll be introducing you to shortly. Um, but today's podcast theme is just based around what is it like to be a classical musician or professional musician? And you wouldn't believe how many times I actually get asked that question. So today we're going to kind of delve into this subject a bit, um, chat about um, what our kind of daily life is, obviously um, pre-COVID-19, and uh, um, maybe discuss about a few little myths or um, habits that we musicians like to do. Um, obviously our life has changed slightly um, since lockdown and we have to reinvent ourselves a little bit but today's focus is more about what our life was like before this and what we all strive and what to getting back to. Um, so I'm going to hand you over to Joanna now who's going to introduce herself. Hi well as Rosie has said I'm Joanna, Joanna Pitkakolan full name. Uh, I am a violinist with the orchestra and I've been associate leader for, was it nine or ten years? I'm losing track, but in and around that long anyway. <laughs> uh, so you want to know a bit about the sort of average working week in the orchestra? Yeah, what, what would your normal yeah. week be? Well, I think the clue is in the fact that the word average doesn't apply. We don't really have an average <laughs> working week. And that's one of the things that I really love about this job. Um, before this, I was mostly freelancing. So this is the first real full-time job I've held. And uh, I was surprised in a way how much it felt like freelancing because almost every day that we come in, we're doing something different. So we have many strands to, to our program. We do um, obviously the normal season concerts, lunchtimes and evenings. Uh, but then we also have a POPs program and we have the LCE, Learning Community and Engagement. So every day really can be quite different. You can be rehearsing for a very serious Shostakovich program in the Ulster Hall one day and then perhaps you might be going out to some schools or doing some relaxed performances perhaps on a Wednesday morning um, let me say what else would you be doing pops programs are great fun of course you've, you've, mm -hmm. you've got the orchestra augmented by lots of different instruments that don't normally make up part of the orchestra bass guitars and we might have singers and yeah, yeah, drum kits highlight and, of the season aren't they <laughs> they really are and we often get to dress up as well which is good fun oh yeah no, a lot of us don't need encouragement there but <laughs> In fact, I remember a fantastic moustache on you, Greg. When was it the Abba night? Oh, yeah. Never quite looked at you the same again. I think um, no, you should adopt Me neither. <laughs> Thanks. So, Greg, as well, how long have you been in the orchestra? If you'd like to tell anyone a little bit about yourself. Uh, I've been here since about, I think, late 2016. So, sort of three, four years. And I joined, like you, I know it's my first full-time job. And... Um, I joined, I, I remember my first ever gig here was on Contra, which was quite daunting. Mm -hmm. But it's, all, it's been uphill since then, I hope. So, uh, um, yeah, so as Joanna said, it's a very varied, we've got a very varied schedule. No week's the same. Uh, we've got the variety we always already have with um, different repertoire mm -hmm. is then exemplified by the variety of actual different types of work that we do. So, for example, I do a lot of, uh, work with the Queen's Uni um, with the uh, students there we do classes me and Colin the recently retired second ovo and um, we do a really really varied range of stuff so as Joanna said we did do work around kids schools we do integrated school projects and yeah it's a really it's challenging but it's a it's the right type of challenge Mm. Yeah, I do actually, one of the, the things I love most about since joining here is actually the variety that we get. And I think we're a very hands-on orchestra, I've noticed. And especially in a, a smaller community like Belfast and all around Northern Ireland, um, I feel everybody has heard of the orchestra, which um, I moved from Manchester and London, and uh, that certainly wasn't the case there. Even if people here have never been to see a concert, they even know someone connected with it or someone has been to watch, you know, so it's... It's really fantastic. Um, I want to chat a little bit to you both about the kind of difference in moving from freelance into a full-time position. So for me, I, I joined a couple of years ago now, and the biggest change in the shop to the system for me was just the amount of repertoire and juggling and keeping on top of things that you had to do. Um, and I think particularly for you both principal players where you, know, you may have to step up last minute. Um, so, Joanna, maybe I'll chat to you about this. How, how do you ca ta tackle with that, basically, um, juggling and just trying to prioritise? 
Well, for me, I think joining the orchestra was an absolute baptism of fire in so many ways. Yeah. The, main, the main thing to point out that's probably different to other people is that when I auditioned for my job, I was eight months pregnant. I did my trial through my eighth month and I was given the job. I think I was discussing my contract while in early labor. Oh, so this is with my second. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a bit unusual in terms of circumstances. But uh, there's a year and a half between my two. So really, I started my job with a two-year-old and a six-month-old. Um, and I had been coming in sort of once a month before that as a sort of freelancer, uh, just to sort of keep my hand in, as it were. Um, but I found it very, very difficult. Uh, not just the hours, but the sheer volume of work. At that point, we were putting out quite a lot of work. Not that we're not anymore, but it was very much... Um, when I started in August, we had two or three concerts a week of BBC programmes, which at that time... Uh, sorry, I'm trying to think now of exactly what that, that year was. I think it was Russian music. Each year, the BBC puts out a different theme. And in August, we would rehearse and perform and record uh, pieces based on those themes. Sometimes they're pieces that we already know, sometimes they aren't. But for me, coming from a chamber orchestra and chamber music background, almost all the repertoire was new. So every week I had to learn at least two full programs. It got to the point where my husband Ross would meet me at the door on a Friday night after a concert, holding a glass of brandy, and just hand it to me. <laughs> just couldn't, couldn't cope. So it was very difficult. So really I didn't feel the transition from freelance work until a few years later when I found my feet. I could really sort of evaluate where I had got to and how I felt about things. And the kids gave me five minutes piece. Wow. Greg, was yours as crazy as that? <laughs> uh, not quite, no. I can't admit that, uh, that I experienced much of a change because I wasn't, actually I wasn't freelancing for very long really because I was just out of college uh the august before i joined in sort of october november so i didn't really Maybe have my youngest member greg i can't remember i'm not sure if i still qualify as that uh, yeah mm. you're down there <laughs> say yes for now yeah hold on to that while you can <laughs> no i think yeah. uh, particularly as a wind player as well how do, um because i know you go off and you play with other orchestras and Joanna as well um what's the difference do you find kind of freelance or well, working in northern ireland compared to going over to London and I've definitely found a, a slower and a calmer pace of life since moving here and uh, I, as much as I love working in London and playing orchestras, I, I certainly don't miss uh, the escalators with my cello on my back, suitcase and I have a bag in one arm. Um, yeah. I can't begin to imagine what that was like with a controversy. Oh it's not worth it, yeah. Even even if it's with an orchestra that you really like, taking a contra on the Bakerloo line does not make everything that much <laughs> worse, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I've noticed, especially when I came here for the first time, that whatever build-up we put on ourselves, especially when we're at college, the gigs and concerts are so sort of, you're so put upon with them, like the big build-up, you've got lots of time, there's weeks, so the gig itself becomes this kind of big aura event. and. I that if, when I took that mindset when I came to Walster, I just couldn't sustain that because we're doing concerts so frequently that if you just keep that, if you try and have that big build up for every gig that you, you're used to doing at college, you'll just end up knackering yourself. We don't have that time. We don't have the luxury to kind of ease yourself in slowly. You just have to accept that time is on our side sometimes, but we just run with it. Yeah, this leads me nicely on to next bit. I hope you can all hear. I think, is there a streamer going off in your garden? I know. <laughs> I've just realised there's a lawnmower. Oh, hey, sorry. Home. It's fine. Um, I like the birds in the background, though. It's very nice. um, <laughs> so, that, yeah, this leads me on, actually. Um, a lot of... Um, uh, I always get asked about what is a concert day like, and there seems to be some kind of myth around... Um, uh, a few rituals or habits that you know uh, musicians kind of find themselves in maybe to tackle, tackle nerves or even just psyching yourselves up and um, um, I think for me it varies so much on what the repertoire has been that week what you know conductor we you know we've conducted so many varying styles you know we have a uh, rapper uh, Piara who our previous uh, principal conductor who just didn't like to do much at all on concert days so then actually come the concert you felt quite fresh and kind of ready to go and then other conductors that you know like to use every available minute and then it was a case of right stamina how am I going to get through this um so I was just wondering do any of you have any kind of habits or um 
rituals that you go through so for example I have to wash my hands before I go on stage before I play um if I don't I just ooh, um feel very yucky and just um subconsciously I, I don't feel ready to perform and I was just wondering do any of you have any weird habits like that I, I actually, I thought I didn't actually. I've been thinking about this question because I figured it might come up. Um, in, in a way, because our life is so different and we play in different places, different conductors, as you say, who have different uh, wants and needs about how long to rehearse and different programs are, um, require different amounts of concentration and input from you as a player too. So in a way, I've tried to wean myself off having habits because if you get in a situation where you can't do your little ritual, then it messes with your head a bit. But actually, now that you mention it, I also wash my hands and I also need to wash my hands in the break. I feel very funny for the second half if I didn't get a chance to do that. Mm. Um, so I think having clean hands is, is very important for a string player, certainly. Um, apart from that, in my chamber music days, I used to not eat before a concert very consciously okay. and now I find I have to eat over a card so I won't make it through <laughs> so that's that's changed but I think food rage would take over in my case <laughs> agreed what about you Pass out by, the, by the interval yeah I need food can't do without food for that I'm I think what... particularly partial to a boojum on a Friday night before a concert but I know. Food... other uh, uh, burrito places are available <laughs> 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 actually what's really interesting about you both talking about washing your hands and how that relates to string playing. It's not a habit of mine, but it's a habit of pretty much all the other uh, reed players, especially, is that they all brush their teeth before they go on stage. Straight, in, straight before they go on stage, they all brush their teeth just because if you play after having eaten with a wind instrument, that's not a good mix. Yeah. Yeah, so I, remember perhaps I used to play flute at school and um, it was rehearsal in wind band during uh, lunch break and I was kind of eating my Marmite sandwich halfway through because I didn't have time to eat any other day and my keys got stuck with Marmite so um, yeah, uh, learn that lesson. Yeah, lovely. That's story for you there. <laughs> <laughs> lovely, see that's what we want to avoid. Yes. But I think I've noticed the only habit I do is that I'm probably the last person out of the hall because I pack up so slowly. I think that's a conscious thing that I do just to kind of keep <laughs> myself over there, keep everything calm, yeah. But they end up being kicked out of the building because they're locking up. <laughs> yeah, I very remember very... giving you a lift home once and being the last person in the car park. <laughs> so you think, where's Greg? Yeah, that's very non-orchestral musician. That actually, most people are home before the last chord is finished. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I mean, actually, this that's a really good subject actually because I I don't know about you, but I, after a concert night, it takes me a long time to unwind before I feel I'm ready to go to bed. Um, usually, a, a glass of my favourite something will help um, and watch uh, something on telly. But um, do you have any tricks? That took, you know it's such a busy world going up there there's always constant noise particularly for me I need quiet my ears I find are really sensitive after a concert and I was just wondering if, if you find the same yeah I agree with you I feel the same actually it takes me quite a while to unwind and I think you work yourself up to such a heightened state of concentration that it's very hard to just fall off the shelf when it's over so it, it sort of you ramp up and then you also need to ramp back down again in, in some ways, the, the days I find hardest are when we have a morning rehearsal after a concert, which doesn't happen very often. But when it does, oh, you really do feel like you've been hit by a truck the next day, don't you? It's very, it's very hard to sort of get enough recuperation time in between. It's a funny thing. It's this constant balance, I think, you know, you've, you've especially in that case, because you've had a concert for that one repertoire, and then the next day is most likely something completely new that you've either had to rehearse and practice earlier on in the week you know I, there's this constant juggling of looking ahead and prioritizing and particularly Greg as a wind player I mean you, you're constantly having to keep um your armature and lip in check and as how do you keep on top of that without avoiding any injury yeah so that's a really important lesson that I learned the hard way when I, I injured my thumb about 18 months ago but I think that Sometimes we try and keep up. We have a set routine of practice that we do when we're free or like a, a little daily thing. And that's just sometimes you have to learn when to let go of it. When you have to accept it's, it's 5 p.m. We've had an all day rehearsal. More playing now. It's not going to help. So it's, it's about giving yourself breaks. 
And what you said about the sleeping, I find it sometimes that I, I, I'm quite the opposite of you, Rosie, that I actually have something on. I have an audio book or something external. So then I don't, so then I externalize whatever's racing in my head is going on outside. So that's a little trick that I've, I do to switch off sometimes. Maybe I'll try the audio book out. <laughs> <laughs> do you Harry guys Pot find, Harry Potter, do you guys find that, um, oh, I've lost what I was going to say. Do you guys, oh, do you guys find that uh, in terms of practice that you've become much, much more efficient with practice? Yeah. Um, right, it's not just kids, is it? I, I think I, having a job yeah. and having it flowing well, it's, it's different repertoire. for you, you Anna, because you know you're juggling kids and, and life <laughs> and a lot. I think probably me and Greg have a little bit more time to uh, to have. But um, um, I teach as well a lot, so it's um, I try and incorporate as much as um, I can in my teaching to help just kind of maintain um, technique as much as I can. So killing two birds with one stone always. Mm -hmm. um, but I if it's a big piece I've never played before and so I'm, I'm quite early on in my career as well and I've not necessarily played a huge amount of the repertoire so I actually like to um, do a bit of karaoke and I plug it in a recording my favorite recording in my and play along um, stop playing when it's just you know something straightforward just to in terms of really, um, looking after myself and then I will go through a part and start what needs looking at and then during the week when I have spare 15 minutes, I can just kind of focus on those little, little bits. And I found for me, that's been a really good use of my time in that way. But I know, I mean, when players, you can't do too much without, you know, ruining your, your chops. So um, I think string players maybe have a li little bit more luxury um, in terms of that, but we have more notes, I guess. Yeah, exactly. It is a balancing act, isn't it? Um, I wanted to chat to you, Jana, about, um, balancing kind of home life is, is music a big part in your household and I know you've got two girls and they both play instruments I think with was it Hannah we saw you in the first it was Hannah on the cello yeah um, yeah well first of all my husband Ross is trombonist so he's actually teaching at the moment which is why I'm banished to the garden banished terrible <laughs> in the sunlight um so he's teaching he's got a full day's teaching at the moment inside meanwhile Hannah is practicing cello they've both done their piano already and I think Nina's about to start her corner practice so yes wow. full house of musicians yeah Greg but, were you um, um, brought up in a house of musicians oh yeah yeah my dad is a uh, pianist and my mum's a flautist so it's quite a loud house I grew up in <laughs> <laughs> sorry back to you Joanna no, not at all. Actually, I'm the same. I come from a family of violinists. Both my parents played and taught professionally, so it's definitely something I'm yeah, used to. I've, I've kind of, this has really intrigued me. So I was um, brought up with family musicians as well. My dad's a trumpet player, um, my twin sister's a trumpet player, and my brother's a violinist. Um, however, my mum is not. She's a pharmacist. Um, so, and she, when she met my dad, she knew absolutely nothing about music. And it's this, I find this really fascinating, this kind of, you know, it is, yes, what we do is a job and a career, but it's, it's certainly, I, I think, definitely a, a way of life as well. And um, my mum has just it's completely embraced it and gone along with it. And um, I mean, she, she's a very competent amateur now and, uh, and loves it. But that really fascinates me for a lot of us. And, um, you know, it is just a way of life and how we've been brought up. But um, for people that aren't musicians, kind of, thrown into this world um i find really quite fascinating and uh, i'm sure um a lot of audience members of ours are in the same boat but um it is definitely a, a lifestyle choice as well you know we don't work the most sociable hours in the world do we um but i find that really quite interesting but um you're so you actively really encourage the girls to do music Joanna. yeah um my eldest Nina, she played violin for about four or five years under serious duress and she could not <laughs> wait to get shot of the thing. She absolutely ah. hated it, really hated it. But she seems to have found her corner here with cornets, so that's great. She'll move on to the trumpet at some point, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, it's something that I think, it's almost like speaking another language. Mm -hmm. It's something that once you have it, you can't really imagine not having it, if you know what I mean music in your life and I don't I don't have any aspirations or, or desires for them to be professional by any means but I think they should be able to read and they should be able to play something and I I feel that's a real um an attitude that Northern Ireland is accepted so well music is just um I've you know, prioritized so highly and 
everyone is given the opportunity or appreciates it. And um, that's what I found really great about moving over here. Um, but particularly, obviously, more than ever, where we're having to kind of completely reinvent what we do. And um, yes, I mean, obviously, a lot of the arts, we're not getting the, the funding that we so desperately need right now. And uh, it's really hard. But I think actually, if any, you know, music is bringing us together more than now, more than ever. And for me, I'm, I don't know about you, Greg, but I'm finding it really, I'm missing it. I'm really struggling not playing and doing our Friday night concerts every week. And as have you um, just wondering how you're adapting to this kind of weird world we find ourselves in? Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's, it's kind of like, it's another side of the, our, sort of our social life. We've got the one side where we actually see other people, but the other side is making music with people. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, that's, I think that's what we're all missing. It's a very social uh, profession, isn't it? Definitely. Yeah. And that kind of, the joy of making music together is I'm glad that we have this technology where we can kind of still do it and it's not obviously it's not the same but it, it can kind of happen and but it would just be in the acoustics of my bedroom rather than the acoustics of the Ulster Hall but uh, we do the best that we can and uh, I think um, I think hopefully we the day we come back I'm looking forward to and I'm wondering how quickly people are gonna it's gonna be snap right back into it i think it's going to be pretty quick i really hope so i think I, yeah i think everyone's just going to miss that kind of whole live experience which yeah like you say social media is brilliant but it still just doesn't capture that energy that a live performance creates does it so you know so much of so, so much of um live uh, music making but also uh, group music making is about unspoken communication isn't it and it's really hard to do that if you're even putting together, as you and I have done, Rosie, recently, this, this piece with six players in it, and each person has recorded their part at home, and then we've sort of stuck it together, and it's come out as well as it could. But there's yeah. no substitution for that engagement that you have with other people without saying so much as one word. You know, there's so much communication that goes on behind the scenes, isn't there? I think it's this, um, you know, I think actually, like you say, it's come together really well. And um, for those listening at home, that will be broadcast soon. And it's um, so Philip Walton has one of our viola pairs, has composed a violin concerto, especially for you, Anna. And um, so, yeah, we all kind of recorded them separately. And some magic technology with it that Philip is has managed to sandwich it all together. And yeah, it has come out amazing. But I think the the thought of live performance, this it's just different every time. And I don't know I, I, how you found this, Joanna and Greg, are you doing on my material, but it's, oh, well, I didn't like that bit, so I'll record it again. And like, you know, you, this is a constant, oh, it could be a bit better. It's lost the magic, I find. And um, I'm definitely, well, I can't wait to get back personally, but I know it's, it's going to be a long road ahead. And uh, thanks for social media in the meantime that we can still reach everybody. Um, but yes, I think that's everything for me. So thank you for joining me today. Um, just to say everybody at home um, from the orchestra, uh, so we can't wait to get back. Uh, do tune in to all of our 3 p.m. slots. There's such a huge variety of things going out, so um, keep your eyes peeled. And um, and down the line as well, some kind of more live broadcast, hopefully. And then when lockdown measures relax, if maybe a few more kind of social distancing, chamber music things. So lots to look forward to. Um, but goodbye from me. And everybody else, thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.